On a quiet back street in Phnom Penh stands a former school that, under the Khmer Rouge, was the communist movement's most important prison. They codenamed it S21. These days, S21 is called the Tul Sleng Genocide Museum. It's become a familiar stop on the tourist trail. Hundreds visit daily, walking through rooms heavy with shackles, torture implements and boards holding the black and white photographs of long dead prisoners. Between 1975 and 1979, this site was the dark heart of the Khmer Rouge's security apparatus, a top secret prison where thousands were brought as suspected enemies of the regime. Most were shackled in large rooms and starved while they awaited interrogation. Once a week, a guard hosed them down with water. Others were held singly in rough cells, their ankles chained to the floor. Brutality and violence were standard. After all, anyone brought here was considered to be quote-unquote dead already. David Chandler is one of the leading historians of the Khmer Rouge era and the author of the most important book about S21. In 2011, I interviewed Chandler for my book and asked him to explain S21's purpose. The function of the place was to document the destruction of Cambodia's, i.g. the party's enemies, to the satisfaction of the leaders. Document the destruction of the enemies of the party. So they come in and they're destroyed. It's a process. They're all dead. There's no question these guys coming back. One man, one problem. No man, no problem. In most cases, prisoners weren't guilty of much, if anything. But under Pol Pot's totalitarian rule, that made no difference. They were to be killed once they had confessed. Once prisoners had given their so-called confessions, typically extracted under torture, and those were deemed acceptable by prison commandant Comrade Doik, they would be taken to the killing field of Chung Ek outside Phnom Penh. Their families would be killed too, even the children. It was the Khmer Rouge's way. Anyone named in three or more confessions was also arrested and brought here as the process rolled on. By the end, well over 12,000 people had passed through S21's gates and all but a handful were killed. A dozen are known to have survived, permitted to live because they had skills Doik deemed useful. Another 170 may have been released. Everyone else was executed. Bu Meng, pictured here, was an artist kept alive by Doik to paint portraits of Pol Pot. This man, Chum Mei, is another who lived. Doik put him to work repairing S21's typewriters. But for most, the only exit from this bleak and brutal place was on their way to be murdered at Chung Ek. Yuk Chang heads the Documentation Center of Cambodia, the country's leading organization researching the crimes of that period. He says it's not widely understood that 80% of those brought to S21 were Khmer Rouge cadre themselves, swept up in the movement's internal purges as it began the savage turning in upon itself in 1976. The division between cadre who supported Vietnam and those who favoured China turned especially bloody. S21, it's, um, it's, it represents the Khmer Rouge paranoia. So they kill their own population, they kill their own country official. So visitors should know that many who died there were from Khmer Rouge themselves. It's, it's a paranoia in the sense that Khmer Rouge were divided, were caught between crocodile and tiger, Vietnam and China. So they start killing each other. And that those lines all about. And then the rest of the 20% that who were not former, who were not former Khmer Rouge official were brought because for other reasons. Among the 20% who were not Khmer Rouge were ordinary people swept up in the purges, hundreds of intellectuals and diplomats who had returned from overseas, and several dozen foreigners. Among the diplomats was this man. Uk Ket was 30 when the foreign ministry ordered him back to Cambodia in 1977. He disappeared on his return. We now know he was brought to S21 and held for months in this cell. My book, called When Clouds Fell from the Sky, is in large part about Uk Ket and the effect his disappearance had on his family in France, who tried for years to find out what had happened to him. Having loved ones who simply vanished under Pol Pot's rule was common to millions of Cambodians. Most victims, though, weren't sent here. The paranoid Khmer Rouge leadership, known as Ankar, 
constructed a web of nearly 200 prisons across Cambodia, and hundreds of thousands were murdered there or simply beaten to death in rice fields and forest clearings. It was a continuation of the violence that characterized the Khmer Rouge's rule, driven by paranoia, hatred, and their belief that the only way to deal with one's enemies was to kill them and everyone linked to them. Today, S-21 stands as a stark reminder of the inhumanity inherent in totalitarian regimes.